Hello everyone and welcome to a week of Linux news for the 2nd of April 2017. Well, that's April Fool's Day out the way and uh, yeah, I just had to ignore the news for that day. I have to say one of the most dedicated gags has to have been from Cody, who faked a domain seizure on their website. Literally, they made the whole thing look like it was shut down and inaccessible. No one could download Cody for, well, quite a few hours on April the 1st. So I've had to grab a screenshot of what it looked like, and it didn't take more than a couple of seconds to work out that it was fake, if you knew what you were doing. Just right-clicking on that image and looking where it's hosted, it was hosted on Cody's own website. And you could have looked a bit further to see where the DNS was pointing, and I think it was something like Cloudflare. I'm trying to remember what I read on Twitter. I suppose it was an interesting time to put that, with the UK trying to crack down on the plug-and-play streaming by blocking the streaming websites. I think the news has been around for a little while, but it seems to be gaining a bit of traction again now, and I've just reading this article on the mirror, and I could spot a mistake immediately when they're talking about this guy who was selling the Kodi fully loaded boxes for about a thousand pounds each. No, they were more like uh, 30 to 40 pounds each, I should think. £1,000 is a lot of money to spend on an item of audiovisual equipment. But anyway, this article is so inaccurate, I'm going to ignore it and move on to the Linux news. Ubuntu is now top of the rankings on DistroWatch, only because it's been classed as Ubuntu Plus Editions, and it has therefore outranked Mint and Debian. That is only on the six-month view, if you go back to looking at, say, the last seven days then they are split up, so Ubuntu is now in fourth place. From ARS Technica, someone is putting a lot of work into hacking GitHub developers. Open source developers who use GitHub are in the crosshairs of advanced malware that can steal passwords, download sensitive files, take screenshots, and self-destruct when necessary. Dimni, as the reconnaissance and espionage trojan is known, has largely flown under the radar for the past three years. It has mostly targeted Russians until early this year, when a new campaign took aim at multiple owners of GitHub repositories. The campaign targeting GitHub users starts with emails that attach a booby-trapped Microsoft Word document. The file contains a malicious macro that uses PowerShell commands to download and execute the payloads. To avoid detection, the PowerShell commands are laced with extraneous characters that Windows ignores, but often tricks anti-malware engines into behaving as if the malicious text strings are benign. The Palo Alto researchers declined to speculate who was behind the campaign or what the motives may be for targeting open source developers. With the attack vector aimed squarely at Microsoft Office, that does eliminate most Linux users. But it's something to take note of, Don't run macros from unsolicited emails. From the Hacker News, Verizon pre-installs a spyware app on its Android phones to collect user data. So Verizon has partnered with EV Launcher to bring a new application called AppFlash, a universal search bar that will come pre-installed on the home screens of all Verizon Android handsets for quickly finding apps and web content. AppFlash is simply a Google search bar replacement, but instead of collecting and sending telemetry data, including what you search, handset, apps, and other online activities to Google, oh, below the belt, it will send them to Verizon. What is worse, just like other pre-installed bloatware apps, Android users can't uninstall AppFlash quickly unless they have rooted their phone. And this is why I will not buy a carrier-supplied phone. AppFlash allows you to search inside apps or browse through listings of nearby restaurants and entertainment. The built-in Google search can also do these things, so there's nothing this app does that Google search can't. I wonder if it can do OK Google as well. Then what is the need for this app? Of course, selling your data to advertisers or other big data companies and make money. Thanks to the US Senate that allowed ISPs to collect and sell your data without permission and banned the FCC from ever passing any rule that would limit these powers. Well done, America. And the privacy policy admits to collecting data about your device and your use of AppFlash services. 
and it can identify it to a specific user. AppFlash information may be shared with the Verizon family of companies, including AOL, who may use it to help provide more relevant advertising within the AppFlash experiences and other places. Hmm. And there's some instructions on the Hacker News on how to get rid of AppFlash from your mobile phone. Another story from the Hacker News, hacker who used Linux botnet to send millions of spam emails pleads guilty. A Russian man accused of infecting tens of thousands of computer servers worldwide to generate millions in illicit profit has finally entered a guilty plea in the United States and is going to face sentencing in August. And this is about the Linux botnet known as Ebery. Just a reminder that Linux users can be infected. Epery is an SSH backdoor trojan which has infected more than 500,000 computers and 25,000 dedicated servers worldwide. Well, there's a timeline there of events, so it dates back to 2011. As far as posing much of a threat nowadays, it's, it's kind of done now really. From ZDNet, there has been a new Orange Pi released. This one being an alternative to the Raspberry Pi Zero W with the wireless, and it comes in at the same price of 10 US dollars. However, the Orange Pi 2G IoT comes with slightly better specs. 2G meaning that it can connect to the mobile network and has a slot to insert a SIM card. So the specs are a 1 GHz ARM Cortex A5 32 bit processor, 256 MB of RAM. Got Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and a 40-pin GPIO connector. They do mention here that the Raspberry Pi Zero W does have double the amount of RAM. And like the Raspberry Pi W, it's a bit limited on the number of USB ports. Look, can you complain for 10 US dollars? Even if you're trying to buy a desktop machine of well that low a spec, it's probably still going to cost you more than that second hand. So not so bad going. From OMG Ubuntu, news which I might have considered to be an April Fool's gag, however it did come out a few days prior to April Fool's Day, Linux Mint may switch to the LightDM login screen, replacing the Mint Display Manager with LightDM. They point out that LightDM is used now on many Linux distros, and will enable guest sessions in Linux Mint, something which Mint Display Manager doesn't do at the moment. However, one downside is it's not as customizable as the Mint Display Manager. And finally, this week's stupid news. Coming from the Electronic Frontier Foundation again, the stupid patent of the month. In this particular example, the US patent number 8473532, or shortened to the 532 patent for this article, a method and apparatus for automatic organization for computer files which began its life in Louisiana University, but was sold off last year to a patent troll. A flurry of lawsuits have quickly followed. The 532 patent covers a computer system compromising a processor, memory, and software for automatically organizing computer files into folders. Said software causing said computer system to execute the steps compromising providing a directory of folders wherein substantially each of said folders is represented by a description, providing a new computer file not having a location in said directory, said computer file being represented by a description, blah blah blah. In other words, put files into folders that contain similar files, do it on a computer system, in case you're worried, office workers from the 1930s might have infringed this patent. <laughs> oh dear, I'm sure I looked at an item of software on Linux recently. I think it was a Python script that did a similar thing. And if I look back to the 1980s somewhere, I believe there was similar software around then. Wow, this is a really new idea, isn't it? The automatic organisation of files. Well that concludes the week of Linux news, thanks for watching and I'll see you all later. <laughs>